All right, welcome to Wednesday. We're in the middle of a three-week run of Green Builder Media webinars. Today we're going to be taking a behind-the-walls tour of six different houses. And in doing so, we're going to compare and contrast material choices, design, and priorities. Now, we're not all able to go on a physical tour of these homes, but seeing as how yesterday was pretend to be a time traveler day, I'm going to declare today pretend to be a home tour traveler day. That means I'll be settling into the proverbial driver's seat of this virtual bus so that our guest can be our insightful and witty tour guide. Now, who is that tour guide, you ask? It's none other than Matt Power, editor-in-chief of Green Builder Media. It's largely because of Matt that Green Builder Magazine has been named Best Residential Trade Magazine for seven consecutive years from the National Association of Real Estate Editors. You see, Matt is a veteran housing industry reporter who has covered virtually every aspect of design and construction. His award-winning articles often tackle tough environmental challenges in a way that makes them relevant to both professionals and end users. An expert on both building science and green building, he has a long history of asking hard questions and adding depth and context as he unfolds complex issues. Now, before we get going, I wanted to let you know, today's webinar sponsors are AMVIC Building System, BASF, DuPont, and Jinko Solar. Like all of our webinars here, you're welcome to submit questions for our guest. Simply use the questions box on the right side of your screen. I'll review those questions and pose them to Matt during the Q&A time set aside after the tour. Matt, are you ready to get this bus rolling down the road? I am ready. Take it away, sir. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for taking time out of your long pandemic in exile to spend a, a few minutes, maybe less than an hour, talking about net zero. At least it's something fun for a change and, and not bad news. Let's, let's talk about some good news for a change. Um, I appreciate also, Mike, that you said I was witty. That is the greatest compliment I've had in, in quite a long time. So I hope I can live up to that. Um, <clears throat> my, uh, my interest in net zero goes way back. And, uh, you know, in fact, I'm working with a, a fellow you may know right now, Steve Easley, who's a kind of a building, building science wonk. And Joe Stieberek and I have a, a relationship of decades back when we first got into this business. So I've been covering net zero and to, to some extent other types of uh, you know, energy efficient home, passive house and, and uh, home certification programs for many years. So this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. So one thing I did want to um, clear up though is I said I'd take you on a tour of a half dozen homes. I'm only actually gonna show you five homes because being a building science geek, I got so distracted with all of the other building science things that as I was putting my presentation, I only had time to throw in five homes. So I hope you'll forgive me that, that minor discretion. All right, let's get going. Let's see if I can get you started here. Okay, first I just wanted to, if, if any of you and many of you be, may be well-versed already in what's going on with net zero energy homes. Now, um, but I just wanted to do a quick primer for anybody who's sort of new to the idea. So. The basic premise of a net zero energy home is that you would produce enough power on site to supply all or most of your energy use needs from that building. Now, when they say net, you know, headlines like this make it sound like half the country has moved into net zero energy homes. Um, that hasn't happened. And I'm going to show you some real numbers of where we are in the net zero energy universe. Um, well, first, I, I threw this in to, to show you where we're going. Under the new Title 24 in California, all residential construction will be net zero. So what's, what the, they're hoping is that this is going to give a huge boost to the numbers, which are here. Okay, so take a look down that chart on the right. This is approximately, I think this is a, a, maybe a year and a half old, these numbers are two years, uh, how many zero energy units there are in North America. Um, we're talking hundreds, not thousands. And you can see at the top, the cities tend to, to spike a lot higher than, than uh, especially the large cities, because what a lot of developers are doing is building multifamily units with you know dozens or, or even a hundred uh, net zero units in one building. So it's a little bit unfair advantage over these single family you know, custom home builders, but the real numbers, look down the bottom here, 
uh, and this is, again, I think this is from 2018. If you look at single family units, there's about 6,000 current zero energy residential buildings in the US. So, I mean, put that in perspective, in a, in a really good year, we might have a million housing starts in this country, right? So we've got a long way to go, but let's look at it a different way. We have a huge amount of white space for that market. Um, and we are gonna change how homes are built in the US and we're gonna create some, some positive news in terms of you know, addressing climate change and changing um, the reputation of the housing industry as we move into this zero energy new universe. Uh, this, this article at the top, I wanted to throw in because if any of you are already building a zero energy house or even apartment buildings, make sure that you log into the zero energy coalition and get your house or unit added in. It's a voluntary, I think, you know, they don't go, go out and hunt down uh, these units. So if you can go in and voluntarily add it, that's going to save everybody a lot of work. Now, I noticed they said the 2019 inventory would be out on August 15th. I checked the website and they are not apparently out yet. So I suspect, like many things, they've gotten uh, held up by the pandemic, but hopefully they will be cranking this new one out pretty soon. Why net zero now? This is the cover of our latest issue of the magazine. Um, you may have heard this term, the all electric house. Well, a few years ago, even like 10 years ago, this idea of an all electric house uh, may not have flown, uh, but there's, there's now the, the science and the technology have converged along with the crises, you know, the, the climate change crises and the uh, volatility of fossil fuels all of these things have converged to make an all electric house both reasonable and achievable. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit as we get in here about the accelerating shift towards renewables and also how the climate change is actually pushing us faster towards net zero. I wanna show you this uh, graphic I came up with. So I put quite a lot of thought and, and research into this graphic about what the all electric house, now this is a hypothetical all electric house, even though you, if you're a builder or a architect or designer, you may have communities that have many of the features of these houses in them already. So when I say an all electric house, I mean there is no fossil fuel uh, hooked up to this house with one exception, that backup generator in the front of the house there. Now I am a fan of propane as a transitional fuel. Um, I think that, you know, it's hard to, um, you know, it, it's not a bad thing to have a backup system with an all electric house. And I think at this point, propane is a, is a decent, um, and it, it's, it's, if you know anything about propane, it's sort of what's left behind in the natural gas production cycle. So uh, it, it, that's the one place, the one exception where I'd say maybe there's a, a fossil fuel play in the all electric house. Now, if you look around at this, I want to point out a few things of the technologies that are really critical. Um, down in this circle on the right, you see this uh, hybrid heat pump hot water heater. Now, I don't know about where you, you all live. I live in Maine and you know, I can walk into Lowe's and buy a, one of these hybrid heat pumps for a thousand bucks and the state will give me something like 650 or $700 back. So it's actually cheaper for me to buy a hybrid heat pump hot water heater, which is three times at least, if, if not either double or three times as efficient as the old fashioned electric resistance uh, hot water heaters. Now, a couple of things I wanted to say about these hybrid heat pumps, if you're not already using them, if you're putting them in a basement, you have to be aware that they are going to lower the temperature a little bit. So I know, you know, up here where it's cold, if you don't have a heat source in that basement, be a little bit careful. It's from the research that I've read, it's only a few degrees that it's gonna lower, but it, you don't want it to drop the heat below the uh, freezing threshold. Uh, the other thing is, the, the good news is it's gonna dehumidify that basement. So at, if you're trying to upsell one to a customer, you might talk about whether they have a, a dehumidifier and they're running it in the basement. Um, putting one of these in can play the role of the dehumidifier, but at the same time, heating your hot water. So there's sort of a double savings there and you could do the math on it. Another thing I wanted to point out on here is, you see there's quite a lot of solar. Over the awning on the porch there, 
there's a new type of solar panel coming out and we work closely with one of our sponsors for this uh, this webinar Jinko has come out with a product called the Swan series and it's a bifacial solar panel so the way these work is the sun comes in the top you get your you know your normal uh, uh, solar electricity production and then whatever light bounces off a reflective surface underneath the panel adds another uh, say 20 percent or somewhere in that range of power to this panel so this is going to be a, a big deal i think because again you, you're using a small amount of space um, and you're getting a major uh, again another major elevation in the potential and the power of a pv panel uh, you see over on the, um, the the roof on the right, and this is one of the things that's that's a little more um, hypothetical is the idea of solar hot water. So solar hot water, I've noticed, has not been as popular. Uh, it has sort of gone. I wouldn't say it's gone out of favor, but but the market is is not uh, what it used to be. Um, and part of the reason for that is because of these um, hybrid hot water heaters is you can run with a solar array you can produce enough electricity now to produce hot water in a hybrid hot water heater whereas before that wasn't really possible so i don't know what's going to happen with with solar thermal on the roofs and i'm interested if anybody's in that business um send me a note and tell me how your business and how you're selling uh, against these hybrid hot water heaters now the other thing i wanted to point out is the the electric vehicle one of the synergies still to come for, and this applies to net zero houses, uh, or I'll, I'll tie it back in, is between electric vehicles and the battery and PV systems in houses. So once that all works seamlessly together, the electric vehicle battery will, will become part of the battery system essentially of the house. And this again is gonna make these all electric houses even more viable. I'm going to, some of this other stuff I'm going to touch on a little later, like the advanced heat pumps and the gas free cooking. I'm going to. All right, so these are what I call game changers. These three technologies, I think probably more than anything else, are the reason that electric homes are now possible. And they're the thing that makes, um, essentially, makes it a lot easier to get to a zero energy. So, I don't know if you're aware of induction cooktops. They operate about 30% more efficiently, um, at least in some studies, than gas tops. That happens to be a Whirlpool model. The thing that people don't know about um, induction tops is that they're actually really good for cooking. The reason a lot of customers insist on gas cooktops is because they have these fine controls and they like to turn stuff way down and simmer it. Well, with an induction cooktop, you can do the same thing with a good one and you can cook on cast iron. And I don't know if any of you are cooks, but for me, be, the ability to cook on cast iron, that, that was the deal breaker for me that, that said, yes, it's time to go induction. Now, on the right here is a heat pump system from Train. Now, the thing that's changed about these heat pumps, and so these can cool and heat these electric homes, not only are they more efficient, they have variable speed motors now, so they ramp up instead of kicking on powerfully, which takes a big surge of electricity, they they ramp up slowly the other major thing that's changed is they can work now down to much much colder temperatures and work relatively efficiently so that again makes them viable for essentially almost any climate and it's one of the things that, that all of the heat pump manufacturers that i know of that's that's been the holy grail of how to make these the mainstream uh, go-to source for hvac so in over on the over on the left again is the hybrid heat pump. So these three technologies are the ones if you do nothing else and you're building new homes or you're, you're doing a major remodel, uh, put this stuff in there because what you're doing is you're getting that home zero energy ready. This is all stuff that's going to uh, benefit from the solar renaissance that is happening. So uh, this this chart sort of backs that up. Look at look at these numbers. So these are these technologies that I was talking about, and I didn't even I found this chart after I had picked the technologies. And so maybe it's more than coincidence that these are the big growing technologies. But I also wanted to point out at the top what's the biggest technology? What's the biggest uh, product of all? Insulation. Uh, so. 
I think we cannot understate the importance of the envelope. So if you don't have the envelope, everything else doesn't matter. I, I, I once did a, a, a chart of a green building pyramid where at the top you had your solar and at the bottom you had your siting and your insulation, right? So the things that are that you have to have the fundamentals in place. If you don't get that shell right, it's not going to matter if you have a heat pump water heater. Uh, you're going to have a lot more energy woes from heating and cooling. So let's let's start to zero in a little bit on that. Uh, this is just a, a graphic illustration of those bifacial solar modules, in case anybody's wondering. Um, again, it's Jinko Swan. You can look it up. I'm not going to play the video. Uh, but you can go online and watch a video of how they work. Okay, so this is the number of renewables being installed. Now it's still, you know, we're we're still lagging, you know, behind in terms of, uh, you know, fossil fuel is something like 98% of the power that's generated in the world. So again, we have a huge white space. We have a long way to go, but the renewable based power capacity is growing fast and it seems to be um, apart from politics, which is good. It, it doesn't seem to be a partisan issue. Like the market is growing of its own accord. And here's why. Look at the price of solar. Uh, this is around 2010. So uh, I think this is a kilowatt. Uh, so this, these are what, what they call levelized cost of energy captures the cost of the power plant, okay, as, as well as costs for fuel, et cetera, et cetera. So if you add in all of these actual costs of using these other forms of energy, solar is actually beating fossil fuels, right? It's beyond parity. We're now in the negative. So sh solar is slightly beating wind. I think wind's, you know, still right there side by, by side with it. But there's really no more... Uh, economic argument for using coal, for example, other than the plant that the plants are already there. So I think what you're going to see is a, a relatively rapid phase out of these other technologies simply if nothing else can drive it, if it's not, you know, ethics, then it's going to be the pure market is going to drive it because it's cheaper. The other thing that's happening is there's been a, like two or three different studies have come out and one of them very recently from RMI that's found that gas stoves are caught in the, the, the uh, what's called the uh, off gassing from these stoves is causing health issues. Children especially, uh, I wanted to show you this, where's this one? Okay, so look at these um, pollution particles per minute. Look over here on the left, that is a gas stove or toaster oven. Now, if you look at the, on the bottom at the second arrow, that's an electric stove. So you've got less than half, what is it like almost uh, maybe a third of the particulate emissions when using an electric stove versus a gas stove. This kind of stuff, it, it may not mean much to you, you know, if you're a builder and you're like, well, one stove's as good as another, but it does mean something to, uh, you know, the, the home buyers and home renovators and people with kids. It's your clients that are really gonna drive the bus on this. Uh, that these, and, and I think what's happened is with coronavirus especially, uh, it, there's become a much greater awareness of things that might be invisible in the air, right? So IAQ is huge. And IAQ is, again, directly related with these uh, zero energy homes. It's, it's a bit, probably the biggest, most complex factor in uh, building a zero energy home, home correctly. Look over there. I just wanted to point out, too, on the right, the fireplace. I mean, I would have thought that the, a fireplace would be a significant source of um, you know, uh, some kind of particulate in the house, but it turns out if a fireplace is built properly, vented properly, it has a very low significance in terms of uh, actual particulate, which is good news for, you know, sellers of fireplaces. Um, you know, ventilation, I don't want to get too far into the weeds on this. Uh, ASHRAE, I, I put up here some stuff from ASHRAE uh, 62.2, the Title 24 version, which is probably the strictest one, which has just come out in 2019. So they have changed some of the rules. And, you know, it's a little, uh, I'd say, less strict, shall we say, if you're not building under Title 24. Uh, but 
they're trying to account for tighter homes. And in some ways, I think it works. In some ways, I think it doesn't. For example, if you look under section two, it says homes sealed to a certain leakage rate, rate will require large fans. The reason I put, but be careful, that was my ad in there, is because as you put large fans in, you then have to have a supply of makeup air to compensate. So it's a balancing act. And this is where, you know, having a, a really knowledgeable HVAC person is really, you're really going to need it now. It's not something you can do by the seat of your pants. If you start getting into zero energy and zero energy ready homes, you're really going to have to up your game in terms of ventilation. Make sure you have somebody who really understands the difference between a zero energy tight home and an older home where we're you know, systems are more forgiving. The number three there is is uh, that you can now use balanced ventilation systems uh, and compare it with other supply only systems. What what this is really doing is saying, hey, go ahead, put in mechanical ventilation. We like the use of mechanical ventilation as a way to make sure that the air is healthy in these tighter uh, types of homes. Um, at the bottom, you know, I, I Joe Stieberek, you know, famously says that you know we, it is kind of a debacle, I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, but the ventilation, he says, we really don't know enough about residential ventilation. And it is such a hodgepodge, you know, you have intermittent ventilation in bathrooms, and you have certain intermittent ventilation in the kitchen, and then, you know, how powerful should your range hood be? So, you need to really take into account balancing the energy recovery, where's the you know how much energy are you losing through your ventilation are you distributing air you know where it needs to be to get fresh air to people and where is that air coming from if you think about those three things it's going to help you a lot in designing your systems uh here's another shift this is from the same uh 62.2 uh, title 24 kitchen range hoods, lots stricter rules on kitchen range hoods. The one that, uh, that I don't understand, and maybe somebody can send me an email about it that, that, that explains this to me, kitchen range hood fans that exhaust more than 400 are exempt. So that means if you have a really, really powerful fan, then you don't have to go through all these other steps of you know cert certifying and so on with the fans. Again, that doesn't make sense to me unless you've got a really good plan for where that air is coming from. And I talked to Mike before the presentation. He said, well, that's, it's, that's easy. He says, you just open a window. And I thought, well, yeah, you could certainly do that. But it seems like that would kind of blow your whole ventilation system. So let's not resort, if we can help it, to opening a window. Let's have a system that when it's minus 12 degrees outside, we don't need to open a window to fix the fact that we put a 600 CFM range hood in our kitchen. Here's another problem with range hoods, and I know, I don't know if any of you have ever been a landlord, but I have, and it's one of, one of my great uh, pet peeves, is tenants never use range hoods. So I did a bunch of research on it. Turns out that most people, at least half, almost never use a hood, right? And when they do, it's, it's for a specific purpose. And ovens, which actually are a huge producer of particulates, they use hoods even less. And again, the big, the big cause of their, or their reason they give for not using them is too noisy. That's, you know, pretty big chunk. But also a lot of them just don't understand why you would need it, right? They, they don't understand that cooking, and, and especially if you're using gas, produces a lot of toxins. And if you look at the actual stuff produced, it's not just, you know, yummy cooking odors, it's, it's chemicals and other stuff that's produced in the combustion process. So, I really think we need to get the word out about range hoods and or put in particulate sensitive or heat sensitive range hoods so that they automatically um, improve air quality. Here's another reason net zero home, uh, zero energy homes really matter right now. We are not making progress on our energy use in this country. What happens is we, we go out and we do some really cool stuff and we've got some great technology. Look at the space heating in 1978, uh, you know, what percentage of our total energy nut that was. We knocked that way back, right? Look at it, uh, this is 2005. It's a little tighter than that now, um, but this, this gives you the, the idea. That's because we increased the number of appliance and electronics and phantom energy uh, devices uh, that we were using. Look at the air conditioning. What happened? That was a cult, probably a cultural shift. So 
we need homes that, that there's no way we can sort of um how do you say this we can't tweak our way out of this problem and the problem that's related to this of course is the more energy we're producing typically the more pollution we're producing so in a way uh, zero energy homes solve both of those problems right not only are they taking us out of the energy production equation but we're actually producing energy on site it's a way to actually shift these pie charts so that in 10 years we could see some really good news also summer is coming that's my my obscure reference to game of thrones because summer is the one that's really coming not winter uh, i talked to steve easley on a regular basis and this summer we've been working on a, a, a remodel project uh, called a revision house called the forever house uh, down in scottsdale arizona and he's been giving me daily weather reports and in his house there's so much heat coming he purchased an older house there's so much heat and so much sun beating down on that house that he couldn't get the upstairs with all the air conditioning running below about 86 degrees so when we remodel that house we're putting a very elaborate sort of sandwich system of uh you know spray foam and uh, thermax and other products to completely break the thermal plane from the roof so that he can reduce the thermal gain in that house so zero energy houses have to take into account extreme weather the heat seems to be the most likely one right now i mean we have these other issues like wildfire and uh you know ventilation related to wildfire and pandemics and other, but let's just let's say heat is a big one because it affects probably more than a third of the country is going to have to deal with this and it's already here the other stuff may be coming down the pike but but if you're building in that region we have to address it now and, and zero energy homes are can are a natural way to do that uh this is rocky mountain institute came out with this uh, report on single family um zero energy homes and a couple things i wanted to point out um there's two different sort of references that get thrown around. There's zero energy ready homes, right? And you can see the definition, I won't read it to you. And there's zero energy homes. They look like they're about the same, but the reality is, especially if you are a builder and you're trying to decide, do I go all the way to zero energy or, or, or zero energy ready? Zero energy ready is way easier to hit the mark on um, much easier sell in terms of the marketplace. And, you know, I, I think if you can hit zero energy, great. But my sort of, I guess my advocacy would be hit zero energy ready, but have some features in the house that you could cross over, for example, by adding some more solar panels later to get it all the way to zero energy. Because it's a long road from zero energy ready to zero energy. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Okay, so uh, zero energy home, uh, you're going to have an average 7.3% cost premium. So it does cost more uh, at the get go to build a zero all the way to zero energy. ZER only have 1.8% cost premium. Uh, that's the RMI uh, comparison. So look at these numbers. If you're, and I know it's, it's the builders who will really be interested in this. So uh, cut to the chase here. A zero energy home costs you of this size, right? To so build a 2,800 square foot house, it's based on the RMI estimates, about $23,000 more to build, right? So a zero energy ready version will only cost you about 6,000 more. So already you've got an easier sell in terms of the, I guess, the upgrade that you might sell to a customer. This is sort of uh, what I thought was really interesting. It's like, why do people, why will people buy or not buy the upgrade to a zero energy home? So these four things, the mortgage, um, which is the, the, this is, it's not really the mortgage, it's the energy savings over the life of the mortgage, right? How much are you gonna save by the time you pay this house? Resale, which is actually the more realistic thing that people look at because, people still move in the US on an average every 12 years, right? So will they have saved enough on the energy savings over 12 years to resell that house? They're, they're actually gonna be thinking about that. The consumer willingness to pay, the research suggests 4% is a sort of an easy threshold to get over. 
and first cost is basically comparing it to what it would uh, what it would be to build a conventional home like this. So look at this uh, zero energy home, right? So this is the zero. This is the harder one. Look at the threshold, the first cost threshold, right? So nobody makes the first cost threshold because it's always going to cost you more to build a zero energy or zero energy ready home. So just forget the first cost. But you've also passed over the four, you're more than 4%. You're not going to have made enough energy back in 12 years, except in Baltimore, right? So you've missed all these thresholds. So all you can sell that house on is that 30 year mortgage threshold, which is, hey, you're gonna save $26,000, right, in Houston. Now compare this to the zero energy ready incremental cost. Bottom line, nobody, you can't build it for the ex same price as a conventional home. You know, you, 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 you're doing it right instead. So, but look at every single threshold you've hit. You've hit the 4% threshold, hit the resale value in every market. And you are, the mortgage threshold, you're still gonna, you know, save them money. Everything works. So it's just an easier, it's an easier threshold. It's an easier sell to get people to embrace zero, zero energy. All right, so let's, let's talk a little bit about some case studies. Um, now, uh, before we jump into these, I wanted to, to, to say too, if you have, if you wanna sort of get something like a certification uh, that you could then brag about on a zero energy house that you've already built, you might wanna look at the DOE's zero energy ready home uh, page. So it's down at the bottom here, E-E-R-E, -E -E, da, da, da. You can, uh, I can send you the slides later if you want. Um, but register your house. It gives you sort of a nice uh, a pat on the back and something you could use as a as a marketing pitch. I think with future clients to say, "Hey, I, I this is an official DOE zero energy home." This is a ZER home. Um, hers rating of twenty. Average monthly energy bill of eighty dollars. It's almost a five thousand square foot house. So this is in Durango, Colorado. This is the stuff that matters, right? It's a, I think actually that R38, it may be a little better than that. I'm not sure if that number's right on the first line, but it's a two by six, 24 inch on center advanced frame. You'll see this a lot. Uh, you know, you know, I used to be the editor of a custom builder magazine years and years ago. and. Uh, you know, even back then people were building with two by six advanced framing. So this is not a new technology, but it is one that you see among your better builders. One thing that I am seeing more and more though is the combination of spray foam and other types of insulation. I was talking with folks over at DASF the other day and they, they're they very uh, interested in this type of, uh, this type of sort of wall sandwiches of, of using either closed closed cell spray foam or uh, open cell, depending on the application and the, and the region with other things like, you know, fiberglass or cellulose. Um, the, the roofs, of course, we're, we're gonna get into a little bit, but, but more important than the roof here is the attic. You notice there's no attic. <laughs> so you get rid of that problem of an attic right away. Uh, 12 inch joists, I, I believe what they did is they combined again spray foam uh, not sure if the R value on that spray foam, but they, it was a spray foam uh, hybrid with R19 bats. So you'll want to talk to uh, you know the, somebody who knows their insulation process because the old school way of just taking a you know single type of insulation and you know blast it all full of uh, you know closed cell or or, um, or some kind of blown in fiberglass are, are come and gone. The other thing is, which we're gonna talk about a little more, are unvented attics, which is, I am a big fan of unvented attics. And, you know, I have been since they were introduced and really advocated for by Building America years ago. Uh, I think they're, they're the only way to go. Uh, foundations also should not be underestimated. Uh, you, you know, very common thing is to use a, a, a insulated concrete form such as Amvic has a nice product and they're, they're one of our sponsors too. So a lot of times they'll build up 
to the uh, the grade level with an insulated concrete form and then sometimes they'll continue on with you know icfs or sometimes they will uh, just switch over to the 24 inch on center system with a hybrid wall system um, the windows you know uh, you're always with windows you're always creating a hole in the wall so you know you can you can spend a lot on and a lot of these good builders do like you'll notice these are triple pane uh, windows and there's but I think more important almost than than whether it's a triple pane or argon filled or some of these other details about the windows is the window placement uh, the and in in hot climates what kind of overhangs are you putting on uh, you'll notice if you if you keep track of our Scottsdale project that uh, Steve Easley has paid a lot of attention to overhangs and placing those overhangs in a, in a way that will reduce the heat gain when it really needs to and this has uh you know like like most of these great zero energy homes has mechanical ventilation MERV 13 filters there's a top view of it under construction uh had a radiant floor system <clears throat> you know all the usual that so this had a total of 7.2 kilowatt pv system so you know that's not a huge system i think it's a that but that should be enough i think honestly if you bumped that up to a 10 kilowatt system this house would probably be full on uh zero energy so you have that option you have a lot of roof space where you could do it here's another home this one's in ohio this is more in the um in in the range of right about the point where you hit the zero energy in your hers ratings this hits the uh, threat just below the threshold i think it starts the zero energy ready home start at about hers 45 or hers 50 and uh, go down from there um, this is a hers 44 so it's just under the threshold at what you would call a zero energy ready home so that's why the energy bill is a little bit higher it's a 4300 square foot house uh, again, it has a ICF system uh, around a radiant floor. I can't, uh, I'm not sure if they did a shallow frost foundation or a full foundation, but I, I believe it was uh, all the way, it was a you know, full foundation with ICFs. Yeah, so uh, 11 inch R22 total ICFs. Um, they did put in a, a vented attic, but they did an interesting um, combination of closed cell foam uh, to seal around the top plates, which, you know, I, I might have been hesitant to do that. I, I probably would have gone all the way with a, with a unvented attic, but they, the, the sill plates and the uh, rim joists and stuff are, are places where you do get a lot of leakage, so they felt like their bang for the buck was, was better there. Again, it's got an insulated basement with the ICFs. Uh, triple pane. A lot of these builders are going with these, uh, these high-end windows, so Hey, if you've got the budget for it, that is the way to go. Uh, down at the bottom here, you see the ventilate, the ERV with, it says MERV 11 filter. A lot of these ERVs come with their own filters. I want to talk a little bit about filters because I think they're really relevant now with these tighter houses and with the coronavirus. So if you look at MERV, and I don't know if you know anything about MERV rating of what kind of particles they will capture. Uh, you really need to get into the uh, you know MERV 16, 17 before you start to pick up viruses, right? So if you're if you're thinking that oh we'll we'll just throw a very high end uh, MERV filter on there and we'll be able to isolate people in the next pandemic or we'll, we'll give people a coronavirus room, you might want to look at HEPA filters instead oh, because what happens is, is you get hot into the high end of MERV filters, you get some uh, air resistance, right? So it can actually, if you just throw the wrong filter in and it's one of these super high end MERV filters, it actually damage your furnace or air handler that way. Now, some units, like I know Train has a unit that has a way of keeping the air flowing at the same time as having these uh, a high MERV rating, but you really want to check but before you just change filters, it's not that simple, uh, and and make sure your your HVAC guy is on board with that, so you know that he's knowledgeable about filters. So this is when we talk about coronavirus, and when we talk about different sizes of particles that we're trying to filter. And this again, in a in a zero energy home, it's a tight house. All this stuff's floating around in the air. Uh, look down on the bottom with a little arrow. Is so there's your coronavirus, 0.1 microns, right? So 
let me go back. Where are we? Uh, 0.3 to 1.0 microns. Down, if you look down at MERV 16 on the in the second column from the left, that's 95% or better. So you need to be up, you know, somewhere in the MERV 16 level if you actually want to capture some of the coronavirus that might be flying around the house. Uh, the other thing that there's a lot of other factors like how how much is the air moving through it? I if the the more the air is moving through theoretically, the more particles it's going to capture. When the thing is not running, however, it is capturing no particles. So there's some complex things you want to figure out. The, my advice, if you're actually trying to create a pandemic room in a net zero house, put its own uh, heat pump HVAC system in the room and isolate the room completely from the whole house system. That's the easiest way to get that done. And this is that same house combi boiler, see is there anything else? Mm, nothing especially. You know, it, it, one of the things that's interesting about these product stat lists is they're not, uh, you know, rocket science. There's they're stuff that's that we're all familiar with, right? But they're doing it all right. They've got all the Energy Star appliances, water sense fixtures, you know, smart enabled. If you don't, if you're not doing this stuff, then you're lagging a little bit behind your competitors, right? Because most of the really good builders that I know have been doing this stuff for years. So this is not new. Here's one in New York from Green Hill Contracting. So this had a hers of minus five, right? Uh, there must have been some other like associated costs. It might just be like the grid hookup cost is why they have a monthly energy bill of ten dollars. Uh, but that's pretty damn good. Uh, you know, they're they're saving almost four thousand dollars a year with this uh, on a compared to a typical house. You know, the same of the same floor plan, same blueprint. Uh, thanks to their efforts on this house. So how did they get this house to hers minus five, which is a actually positive energy? Well, they used ICFs, right? Uh, they have an unvented attic. So an unvented attic, <clears throat> they they used open cell spray foam and they combined it with closed cell spray foam, right? So they got an R65 with that roof. Now, uh, one of the things that when I was talking to uh, uh, Brad over at BASF the other day, we were talking about spray foam and especially I'm, I'm very familiar with construction in Florida. And a lot of older houses there don't meet the hurricane code, but spray foam has a strengthening effect on roof assemblies. Unfortunately, the insurance companies haven't recognized it yet, but he said, you know, there's a lot of reason to use different types of spray foam in different climates. He says like in Florida, you wanna use uh, an open cell spray foam like in roof, in roof cavities. Um, he said in, if you're trying to do a soundproofing application, so you don't want to spray a whole wall cavity, for example, with a closed cell spray foam because the stuff is so dense that it transmits sound. So you want to break it with like a partial um, uh, open cell and then use partial closed cell. So there's a lot, of, a lot of nuance that's coming out now in building science about using these different products wisely. Um, this again has, a, in, uh, you will not see a zero energy house without either an insulated uh, slab or an insulated basement. So there's, a, you know, you can use lose 20 to 30% of your energy in an uninsulated basement. So if you're not already there, uh, let, you wanna add that to your repertoire. Again, nice triple pane windows, e, an ERV. Um, this, this one's got some smart sensors in the house, the ventilation, right? That, that controls when the ERVs boost and when they don't. That a good HVAC contractor can do that kind of thing. You know, Panasonic's got a lot of stuff now with smart sensors and they can tie in, a, they have a Cosmos system that's a smart system that's just come out where they can tie things together. Train has a system like this, Carrier has a system like this. Uh, there's, there's no shortage of really great smart HVAC balancing systems. And you know, also I know there was, notice somebody from Passive House was on this call. Passive House has done a really good job of managing ventilation. If you have questions about how to balance ventilation in a really tight house, the Passive House people are a great resource for that. So that, that's, don't overlook them as, a, as somebody you could go to. Ducted mini splits. Uh, there's, your, there's a picture of the uh, attic, the sealed, unvented attic, got a heat pump, hot water heater, 
um, all the basic stuff. There's another house. Uh, this is another one from the same builder. It's in Gardner, New York. A HERS rating of two, right? So again, they are almost at zero energy, right? So there's probably just a few little ancillary things that are driving that bill up to 35 bucks a month. Um, so they're saving $5,500. I mean, that's a pretty easy sell to a client. We're gonna build you this house and we're gonna save you $5,500 a year, all right? Uh, that it seems to me that that's not a hard argument to make and especially this is a zero energy ready home right so it's not even zero energy so theoretically you've only added 1.8 percent to the cost of building this house and look at the payback that the owners are going to get icfs again uh r64 said this is the same builder so it makes sense he's using the same system he's got these vaulted uh unvented ceilings r64 uh, you know, if you look at these houses, the three or four houses we've looked at before, this guy has really figured something out. I think with the it, the addition of the unvented uh, ceilings and unvented attic space has made a huge difference. I mean, he's he is by far the closest to uh, a zero or or to positive energy production. So he's he's got this system down. I don't you know I don't know if he's got the most beautiful houses or the what the custom you know people want but he certainly has got some good science going on in terms of energy efficiency and payoff, right? Uh, let's see, regular stuff, ICF, spray foam, triple pane windows, hurricane clips, no VOC paints, et cetera, et cetera. Just a damn good builder. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, volatile. So if you guys are building or you're remodelers, you know this, this chart, <laughs> which is, the dimensional lumber has shot through the roof about the time the pandemic really got going. Uh, this, this, I thought the statistic on the right was interesting. Price of framing lumber topped $800 per thousand board feet, 130% increase since mid-April. Now, recently, I know that the, these prices have started to fall, but during this time, a lot of people have, have asked us, and we have done a little bit of writing and researching about uh, alternatives to structural systems and how can you you know replace dimensional lumber how can you replace sheathing like osb plywood these kind of things uh one of the things that comes up a lot is icf versus stick framing right so this is a an ambic uh, icf house going up i think they've uh, you know it's, they're, they're doing the walls as well as the below grade um the way this works out in normal times uh, is that ICFs tend to be a little more expensive. Uh, some of the research suggests $1 to $4 per square foot over stick framing. Um, the ICF people always point out that they're, because the buildings are more energy efficient, you can then, the cooling and heating equipment can be more precise as cuts almost a dollar off of that cost, right? But what's happened too is now because of the spike in lumber and OSB and also the shortage of labor, ICFs have come very close, if not reached parity with stick framing. So it's actually a great time for ICFs. And the, uh, you know, the only thing I, I would say as you get, if you decide to get into the ICF world, I mean, these companies like Ambic have all kinds of resources to help you. But don't just assume you can just throw the stuff out there with an untrained crew and you're going to, you know, immediately get price parity. There is a little bit of a learning curve. And, that, you know, one of the some of the research that I read says that crew experience, once you get that crew up to speed, though, you can actually even beat uh, framing if you can get it to the point where the crew knows what they're doing. So, but you do have to get them trained. And there's other stuff you have to figure in, like how do you frame around those windows and doors? The bracing and scaffolding, is that something you're going to rent? Or are you going to own and where you know when do you make that investment so these are just other little considerations i don't want you to go into it blind but you go into it with your eyes open you can really make icfs uh, a practical and um, cost efficient system plus you get all the perks of it like soundproofing and and you know basically storm proofing even very resistant to uh, floods and storm surge. It's, it's actually a great system for coastal building. Some of this research we've done shows that these things hold up better than anything on the coast. Uh, so that's one way to go to react to some of this lumber volatility. 
Now sheathing, we know OSB and plywood are very volatile. They went through the roof for a while. Um, there's two different systems I wanted to let you know about. So rigid styrofoam, and that is styrofoam brand. Okay, so uh, there, there is a method that is, you know, code approved to use styrofoam from DuPont, which is, I think DuPont now owns it, with lead-in bracing. Let me show you what that looks at, looks like. So that's, you see the picture on the left, that's, that's what they call lead in bracing. See, essentially you brace your walls and you can do it also with these special metal hardware. That's a Simpson uh, strong tie bracing. That's the actual model number of it at the bottom. Now, once you've done that and you've essentially given the wall the shear strength that's required, you can then put styrofoam directly over it, which gives you a couple of advantages. Uh, first, you've broken the thermal bridge between the wood and the outside. So especially like in a cold climate, uh, this can be a major energy boost. And of course, you still have the cavity free where you could do a hybrid system inside that cavity. You could do a fiberglass or cellulose or, or spray foam, whatever you want. So you've, you've replaced the, um, the OSB and you've gotten rid of that problem. And at the same time, greatly boosting the uh, energy a value of the wall system. So that's sort of, uh, I, I had written an article about it recently without OSB panels. Um, this, okay, so this is the HP, I think it's actually the HP plus wall system. Um, now BASF, what they've done, we were talking about hybrid systems where you combine uh, like a spray foam system with a neopore, graphite enhanced rigid foam insulation. So it's a little bit similar to the styrofoam uh, application. But again, this doesn't involve any OSB, right? You get a super efficient wall uh, and you've avoided all of those supply chain problems uh, and you get a, a very high performance wall. It's another alternative to the OSB. And uh, here's, here's the one that's near and dear to our heart. This is one of our Green Home of the Year Award winners, a friend of ours, Gene Myers. You, you may know him, he's a great builder and a, a good guy who uh, just keeps kicking it and, and, and uh, should I say, knocking it out of the park with these homes. So this is a HERS 8 home. So annual savings, $4,550. That's, that's a pretty good pitch to a potential uh, homeowner. And if you look up in the top right, you can see the PV on the roof of this thing. So it's got quite a large uh, PV array. But the thing that's interesting about Thrive is basically all of their homes are now coming up to this level, right? They're just outstanding in terms of performance and energy efficiency. One of the things that, that they do, and not, not necessarily in every home, is they do sort of old school, uh, they don't take any chances. So they're doing double wall construction. And any of you guys who've been in the building business a long time have seen this, it is a, uh, it's a sort of a fail safe way to get a really, uh, you're almost building a, a house within a house uh, to get a really efficient wall system. So you're blowing in fiberglass, you know, you could, you could add, a, you know, an outer uh, or an inner la layer of rigid foam if you wanted to, so if you wanted to boost that wall performance even higher. Uh, but I, you know, I think the level of performance they're getting is excellent. Uh, he's got uh, real good air sealing on it. They use a lot of spray foam. Uh, they use spray foam selectively to, uh, as we were talking about before, to, to seal rim joists, which can be a real leakage point. Um, their HVAC, notice he, has, he uses uh, MERV 16 filters in his HVAC. That's because he's really on top of the IAQ issues and even the viral stuff. Uh, you know, with a MERV 16 filter, you are ready for just about anything. And you know, another thing I might mention is these filters will help you deal with wildfire smoke too. And if anybody lives out in that region, wildfire smoke was getting indoors all over the West and even the Midwest this year. It was pretty scary, the, the level of particulate. And it's really put a new urgency on air quality and especially in tight homes. What do you do with, if you get, if you're pulling air into that house, even with an ERV, you want that filter on that ERV to be good enough to filter out those larger um, and, and smaller uh, particles that might be from pollution like wildfires. This is uh, Gene Myers Thrive Home Continued. Um, you know, the, the rest of it's pretty standard stuff. It's the smart, it's the water sense. It's a lot of, a lot of the reason that he's able to achieve these levels is attention to detail. Like there are no penetrations that aren't properly sealed and spray foamed and caulked. 
uh, you know, he's, he's using very high efficiency uh, HVAC equipment as well. So I guess it, uh, I, I'd say if you were looking for a role model of somebody who's doing relatively conventional construction, but just doing it really well, uh, Gene Myers and Thrive Builders might be a good role model for you. And uh, I wanted to leave it uh, leave it there. I I think short and sweet is is always better than long and boring. So uh, why don't why don't we take a few questions, Mike? And I'll try to you know help anybody out with thoughts they might have, or if you just want to somebody wants to make a point that maybe I missed, uh, happy to touch on that too. All right, Matt. Thank you much. <clears throat> we do have a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> we've got a couple on uh, heat pumps yep. and one on hot water heaters and sure. one about embodied energy. So let's yep. take those <clears throat> in that order. Um, first on the heat pumps, uh, Mary Jo, and, and this is going to be a really interesting conversation. So I want to I want to give you yep. both questions because of the dichotomy. So gotcha. first, Mary Jo is in Minnesota and mm -hmm. she's saying, you know, they're wary of heat pumps because when they're below freezing, they need a backup. Um, yep. Is that still true? Meanwhile, our good friend Fernando from Puerto Rico yep. says, will a heat pump work in a climate like we have in Puerto Rico to cool a house? So you want to talk about heat pumps yep. and how they work in those very different climates? I do. Yeah. So uh, it's a really good question. And I'll tell you, I had actually had a bad experience uh, with heat pumps because I got them before the latest upgrade in technology. So I have spent a huge amount of money on some three three uh, heat pump uh, splits in my building. And they only work to, I think about six degrees. They go down to, once they get to about six or 10 degrees Fahrenheit, all of a sudden the efficiency drops like a stone and I end up with $300 electricity bills again. Uh, fortunately, I know that Mitsubishi and I believe Train both have now come out with models that go down efficiently, I believe into the 20, minus 20s. Uh, I'd have to look it up. I don't have a way to jump online right now, to, but it's it's somewhere well below zero. And correct, I, forgive me if I'm not right on the money, but you can definitely get models now that can handle the cold. And honestly, had that not, if I had it to do over again, I would actually not have put the, the mini splits in when I did. I would have waited for this new technology uh, because now I've got the system and I don't really have a way to upgrade it. So it's sort of like buying those those Arlo cameras that all failed. You know, like <laughs> there's certain things you find out after the fact, but I actually think you are safe to get, if you go with a brand that has focused on this low energy uh, application, you are definitely, the game has changed on heat pumps and it is safe to use in places like Minnesota. So that definitely, uh, I, would, I would not shy away from it. I just get the right product. Um, and on the Puerto Rico question, absolutely the, um, you know, heat pumps really thrive in hot weather. I mean, honestly, they uh, they are, I, I did some calculations on it a while back. So with heat pump cooling, I think you basically, it's a one to three versus, like if your air conditioning bill, say your air condi conditioning bill is $300 with a conventional air conditioner, with a heat pump, you can figure it's gonna be about $100 for the same cooling. Um, so that's a pretty good, I mean, that that's the math you, you'll wanna do is, how much is it going to cost you to, to install it? There's very little maintenance involved, but it, I suspect, you know, if you're saving, uh, you know, 200 bucks a month, right? You're, you're going to pay that down pretty quickly. Uh, one thing I would say about heat pumps is check around. Uh, it, different installers have vastly different prices for installation. And um, there, you don't necessarily have to pay premium dollar to get a good heat pump installation you know get some recommendations but don't take the first estimate that you get get find out who's a good team in town you know make sure they do a good job but then get three estimates and a lot of people just jump on that first estimate and you can literally end up paying two or three times what you need to for an installation i go i'll take another one if you want mike Yep. Yeah, we got we got uh, two more because I know you got to go. And uh, just for those who are saying in questions, it's fine to send in questions. What we can do is we can have Matt follow up with you um, post webinar. Um, yep. So David had a, a pretty basic question here. Um, can you explain uh, the word hybrid with the hot water heaters? 
Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. So with the, this is one thing you want to check when you buy these, when they say hybrid, it usually means they can run the old fashioned way on resistance electricity, or they can run using heat pump technology where they basically steal heat from the surrounding air around them. Uh, you definitely want to, I'm not sure if all models have this capability. So you want to ask that question because what you want is if, for example, you have this in a space and it's real cold, right? And the, it's sort of the same question as the heat pumps and it gets to the point where it's not efficient, that hot water heater should switch over automatically to resistance heating. So you still have hot water, right? You don't want it to shut down just because it's not efficient anymore. So you want a hybrid, which means when the temperature and the conditions are right, it runs in the most efficient mode. But when they're not right, it still runs, if that makes sense. Okay. Yep. And uh, the final question we're going to take for today, like I said, we will be following up with people who have sent in questions. Mm -hmm. um, so Matt wanted to know, what, are, what about all the embodied energy of some of these products? Um, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Or, I'm with you. So yeah. I, yeah, that's a good question too. I mean, great. These are all great questions. I embodied energy is something that I have actually covered for years. Uh, and you know, there's, there's been different studies, but I would say that the, the most sort of reliable estimate of embodied energy, and this almost doesn't matter what you use in the uh, initial construction of the house is that the house, the, the embodied energy is about 11% of the total energy used by the house over its lifetime. Now, it gets a little vague in there, right? Because what's a lifetime? Is it 100 years? Like in the US, we have a terrible standard for what's a lifetime product in the US, right? Like a lot of stuff's 25 years, 50 years, it's all over the map. You know, other places like even Canada has, has better standards for what's lifetime. So you basically are in the 11% range for a house that's gonna, la gonna be operated, say for 50 to 100 years. That's why, you know, even things like spray foam, which I, I've often asked, you know, manufacturers to spray foam because they have a fairly high embodied energy, but the, the benefits of the greenhouse gas reduction happen almost immediately, right? So you spray your foam in and, and in the next month you start benefiting from the fact that, you know, yes, you uh, you had a you had a small sin, but you um, you get a little bit of uh, you get a lot of angel points after the small sin, and you know like the the fact is that and I will say that even I showed you a bunch of large houses today is we are advocates for smaller houses. However, you know I don't everybody's got their reasons and every and a lot of times the custom market frankly won't buy smaller houses but the best thing you can do to reduce your embodied energy of course is to live in smaller spaces and i mean i live in small space and you know some of my friends don't uh but i think over the long haul we do need to take seriously the idea of how much space you use and what i'd like to see is creative use of space where instead of having you know dedicated rooms like lit dining rooms and and this sort of thing and uh you know uh foyers and all these rooms that are not used and you can look up research on this if you look at like a cluster map of where people use in their homes it's stunning because like 80 percent of the time or something like that is standing around in the kitchen right so i think that if you talk about embodied energy and what we really ought to talk about is can we not so much changing our materials i i, I think these high-tech materials the price we pay uh, ecologically probably is worth it in terms of the if, the, if that house is going to be around for 100 years because you're going to burn so much fuel trying to heat and cool and power that house otherwise uh, so yeah i'm with you on the embodied energy i i hear you and it's a question i ask all the time is how do we get embodied energy down i think frankly we shrink the houses and we get people on board with living smaller, living more, living more creatively and cleverly in multiple, multiple um, use spaces. Uh, but I don't think changing the material composition right now is the answer. All right. Well, thank you, Matt. I appreciate your time today. And uh, I, uh, Certainly appreciate our audience. Thank you for attending, asking great questions. And like I said on those questions, if uh, we didn't get to yours, and I know we didn't because I see all the questions that come in, um, 
don't worry. We're going to follow up with you. Um, yep. So thank you very much for attending. Also, thank you to Amvic Building System, BASF, DuPont, and Jinko Solar for their generous sponsorships. Now, we hope you'll tune in for our final webinar of 2020. Next week, we'll be joined once again by Sarah Gutterman, CEO of Green Builder Media, as she delivers a special report on the state of the construction industry. That webinar will take place on Wednesday, December 16th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. So please make a note of the later than normal start time next week. We wouldn't want you to miss it. Until next week, stay safe out there and happy Hanukkah to anyone who's going to start celebrating that on Friday. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Happy holidays.